Rogers. Um, if you're a viewer, this is how you fulfill your self-interest. Okay. Is there anything anybody else thinks that can comprise international relations? Simple working definition from Highland 13 is the study of international events and actors. So what are some types of international events that have been happening as of recent that could constitute IR?
okay, once we have established that there are many different states, we have <coughs> over 190, what sort of determines what characterizes the international order? Can anyone tell me what a unipolar order is? One in which one country or nation state holds entire hegemony. Right, that, you know, the answer is in the word. Uni describing one is where a system, the international system, is dominated by one single power. Can anyone think of a time period in which that is true? Yeah? Soviet Union. Oh. Mm -hmm. You want to take a crack at that Soviet Union one again? Why do you Why do you think they were unipolar? But they didn't turn on everything that they control. Right, but the, the critical distinction is everything. Um, like right now, the U.S. agenda. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is the you know biggest distinguishable time in history and the largest. Uh, differential gap between a you know singular power and the rest of the world at any other time. Now bipolar. Now you had something there, Javon, with bipolar. Can you think of a time period in which there were two large powers running at one time? Yeah, it was completely comprised of two major powers. And, you know, there's a lot of literature on this subject that would suggest that that's a very sort of stable organization relative to many, many different powers that is much more dispersed and one single power that sort of retains all, you know, distinguishable qualities and choices of, you know, whether cooperation happens or policies get implemented in the international sphere. What about multipolar? Yeah. Uh, I'd say before World War I, uh, all European countries, mm -hmm. U.S. You had different grades. Oh, yeah. Uh, feudal Japan, feudal uh, Europe. And there are also, you know, a lot of predictors that we're going to be seeing that in the future, too, that, you know, the sort of trends that we're looking at and, you know, our rough economic position and a confluence of multiple factors would determine that we can't uh, continue that inevitably. Now, the second type of actor that is a very, very recent trend in international politics, non-state actors. Can anyone think of some non-nation states that are acting in the international division? Uh, kind of. Mm -hmm. Terrorist groups. United Nations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. NGOs. Mm -hmm. Can you give me some examples of some non-governmental organizations is what NGO stands for? U.S. 
in its environmental policies versus what the rest of the world wants us to be doing? So people who haven't raised their hands yet. Yeah. Like the fact that it's an issue that's politically divisive at all. Yeah. It's it's a lot, definitely a lot more up for debate in the U.S., right, and some other uh, more liberal democracies, right? The Whether warming exists or not, it's a lot more up for debate here than some and other countries would like it to be. What do you think the scientific consensus is on that? Yes. What's the percentage... What, what do you think is the percentage of scientists that agree <coughs> global warming exists? 73? 73? 70. Higher? Um, 90. Higher? 99. Higher? 99% of scientists agree that global warming is happening right now. And we're st in the United States, we're still having a debate about it. Are you serious? But America. So, what are some reactions you think that invokes in other countries, or some opinions they might have about that? Um, maybe not yeah. Uh, that we'll right. Do you think that gives them a lot of motivation to work with us, and to think that if they extend a hand, that we will follow through as well? No, it doesn't. You know, we had Copenhagen as of most recent. Before that, during the Bush administration, we had an attempt at the Kyoto Protocol. All attempts to have a global cooperative mechanism to reduce emissions, right? Because can one country solve global warming? Why? Because there are 190 some other ones that are pumping coal and oil into the atmosphere and what other other pollutants to continue the problem. So this is a unique situation which demands that everyone works together. And some other countries might be a little pissed off that the US is one of the only few that can not decide you know, to sort of come to the table. But say there are a few other stragglers that are still deciding some lesser powers. And we, in fact, do get the U.S. to sign on. What do you think that would affect the decision calculus of some other minor powers if the U.S. did get involved? Uh, they would probably fall asleep. Uh, going to say that the, uh, the biggest power in the world. Uh, the exactly. So even if there are still a few stragglers, and there are. If we could get the unipolar power on board that generally most countries tend to respond to, everyone else is going to kind of fall in line. And what we call a country that has power, but also legitimacy, is authority. What about some other examples aside from global warming that may have brought up some feelings of non-credibility or illegitimacy of the United States federal government? <laughs> Indistinguishable placing countries on lists that we've made up in the first place. Uh, mitigation in international wars. What do you mean? Uh, like the conflict in Syria. Uh, our mitigation in that, we have, well, I'm not going to bring my own political views into it, but some people might think that we have no business anywhere else in the Middle East. Right, you know, war is generally, you know, divisive as it is, no matter how perceived, you know, legitimate. A global economy. And what about, what, what about the global economy? Okay. Um, like the, well, a lot of people argue that the U.S. like the economy of the United States is like falling down, so it's like other countries might like view view it as like lack. lack sure. Of, like, in particular, to the global economy, it's something big that happened in the last few years. The Great Recession, as they call it, when we had 
previously when we have these sort of problems we had the G8 come together. Every single one of those countries was a liberal democracy that the U.S. liked. But you know what? They weren't big enough for this problem. They weren't good enough. So they had to extend this organization to a lot of unfriendly countries from the U.S. perspective that we don't like to bail us out. We have gone from the biggest lender to countries that need help, you know, impoverished countries that need development assistance, countries that need food, to the biggest debtor in the world. The just sheer amount of currency that the Chinese own from the U.S. that we have had, you know, to dole out because we've got to borrow some money is extensive, just massive. And during that crisis, all those other countries that we had previously deemed unfriendly, they picked up the bill for us. It wasn't the U.S. that saved the global economy. What about some other things? that we do that other countries don't like so much and may hinder our good image. Our financial instability as a federal government. Right. What, what was something uh, big that happened, I guess, perceived from the international... Our sequester and $17 trillion debt. Our big, we had a giant credit downgrade because of that. We never thought it would happen. But perceived from a lot of other countries, you know, the way economics generally works, it's a lot about perception. Do investors think this is a, a safe bet for their money? And all those sorts of general calculus change in a world where, you know, the biggest government in the world, the person who's supposed to fix every problem for everyone, or at least says they can, can't do it anymore. What about some other things that are illegitimate? What about, you know, some war practices we've had? Are you wrong? Drones. What about how we treat people we call terrorists? What do we what do we decide we can do to them? And yeah, people don't really people don't really like that. And all these things sort of add up as a confluence of factors that really damage the legitimacy. So even if we materially, right, we still got more nukes than everybody, we still got a bigger and better military than everybody else, our economy, while still on the tanks, is still relatively stronger than every other country. Our GDP is larger than most of them combined. All of these things are still true. I mean, you know, technology, we're still innovating out the wazoo. But if no one sees this as a valuable partner to work with, if no one sees the threats we make against countries we don't like as legitimate and credible, that they actually have to believe we will do it. All of that other stuff does not matter. The fact that we have a substantial advantage in most areas that you can list does not matter if people don't think we're a place to work with or a country to be scared of. So, not every government in the world is a perfect nation state, right? There are some countries that, what we call failed states, failing states, rogue states. We've got a lot of terms we've made up for a lot of countries. Anybody tell me what the situation for Palestine is? This is big in the news. Yeah. The UN's recognizing them as a state. Right. Before that, they were not previously recognized, and they tried, you know, to make a bid for statehood. So what was one of the critical determinants that we set up a state? They have to have a complete monopoly of what? Right. What did Iraq have when we were there? They didn't have saying a damn thing. We went into their country, took their government, and they took orders from us. 
In 2005, they did not have sovereign control over authority and of use of force in their country. Failed states. Can anyone take a gander of what we consider a failed state or what a failed state is? Yeah. Sure. Anything else? Yeah. A state that no longer meets your requirements. Right. It's just, you know, basically, you know, a government essentially, you know, that can just no longer fulfill the needs of their people, right? They can't provide public goods. They can't protect their citizenry. The monopoly on the use of force is in decline because generally there's like civil war, civil, civil conflict. This happened in the 90s with Somalia and obviously the situation in Afghanistan and Iraq and the early parts was very dire with uh, the Taliban having significant uh, portions and factions of control within just the government and sections of the country itself. You can see how governments that uh, are not the U.S., how we like to depict them in international politics. This isn't the esteemed Afghani army that you would like to picture them as doing drills. This is the U.S. government making a mockery of every other attempt and in period of invasions. Now, sovereignty. This is another critical determinant of whether you have officially reached statehood yet. You need to have the highest political authority within that realm, right? There are other political organizations, etc. All those things are fine and acceptable within governments, but you need to have the critical determinant, the final call of whether uh, you know you have an official ability to use other force, and that no other unit, no other government, no other terrorist organization, no other political faction has that say. It is one single power that has the highest authority that is able to critically determine whether you are indeed a sovereign nation or not. So generally in times of military invasion or civil conflict, this line becomes very blurred and sketchy to determine whether a government does indeed have this political control. Now, power. Once you've determined that a government or a region is indeed a state, there are different ways in which they can exert influence in the international realm. What are some examples of uh, like market power, maybe from the U.S. or other forms of government that you could potentially exert? Sanctions. Exactly. There's not always, you know, positive cooperation with countries. You can tell them, or tell the world rather, that you're not allowed to have a certain inflow of goods or a certain export of a product that you like. What are some other examples of market power that we could exert? Yeah. Yeah, we can fund their domestic social programs. We can fund social programs for development, for poverty, things that generally work with leaders we like to get them votes in the next election. Social programs are real good in some of these uh, sketchy regimes that we support. Okay, I'm just gonna ask, isn't it possible for us to support a leader that like, kinda turns on us, kinda like what we did in Afghanistan? Yeah, what, can anybody think of another example of where we've supported as, as of recent, I guess, in particular, where we supported some governments that blew back. Egypt. Mm -hmm. But it's a bigger picture than just Egypt. Um, Osama bin Laden. Okay. Saddam uh, Hussein. Yeah, let's just go ahead and say the Middle East. 
<laughs> Something like. Let's go back to the times of the Cold War. Big leader in Afghanistan, the Soviets wanted control because we were just grabbing states right and left and throwing them at each other. Oh, we said, we'll give you some weapons. We'll give you some access. You fight off the Soviets. That happened. We were buds. It was all good. And then September 11th happened. It didn't return the favor so well. Egypt is part of a broader trend called the Arab Spring, as of recent, which were all regimes that the U.S. has immense defense contracts with, immense funding, because this is a regime where instability is not an option for the U.S. Because what are some things in the Middle East we want to keep, uh, keep in check? Oil. Yeah. We don't like tourists, but we do like uh, some oil. So all of these regimes had democratic uprisings in which, you know, maybe they were trending towards more religious and Islamic regimes, but they were regimes that the people thought were preferable than to the puppets that we had in power. These are all sort of examples of what the CIA calls blowback. They are unintended consequences to actions that we've had. Maybe all the actions we had were, you know, good intention, and we thought about it at the time, seemed like an instant action, but a projection of the future probably would have determined giving terrorist weapons would come back to bite us. What about cultural power? Like, for example, if, like, the United States wants to change, like, the political organization of, like, other states, like, you, like, mm -hmm. for example, if we want to make a socialist nation, like, democratic. Exactly. Liberal, you know, liberal values that we have, that democracy is the only correct sort of form of government, that it needs to be a non-secular, or, say, a, uh, a non-religious, uh, form of government. Westernization. But what are some things, what, what, you know, characterizes making them more Western? Uh, spreading of, like, American, uh, like fast food stuff into the other... Yeah, fast food. Yeah, what about pop culture? What about... <coughs> Getting the Jersey Shore to show in China. I don't know that those are the values we want to spread, <laughs> but no. you know, a lot of other people see Hollywood as sort of, you know, the biggest movie production and accessibility area in the world. You know, rap music, just like, you know from Asia, supposedly, their transition of cultural values to us is kung fu movies, apparently. Those are forms of soft power we throw back and forth at each other in a big power dynamic. Um, is immigration a part of cultural power? Because, like, you spread cultural values. Like yeah, definitely. Definitely. Cultural value is just sort of a comprisement of sort of Western values, things we, you know, believe in, the American dream, individualism, capitalism, democracy, etc., etc., that we would prefer that all other governments have. What about this third form of power? Encouraging other countries to have a blue water navy instead of a brown water. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by that? For those, just explain for those who don't know. Oh, okay. Uh, so the United States is currently the only country in the world that has what's called a blue water navy. It means that they uh, can refuel their ships as they're in the water and they can stay in the water for as long as we have the oil and things to fuel them and can get it to them where that they can have it themselves. Whereas brown water navies always have to go back to uh, a refueling port or different things like that to get their fuel they aren't as efficient at staying out in open waters for longer periods of time. So the United States government has been encouraging governments like Britain, France, and I want to say 
Japan to try and have blue water navies uh, like the United States. What are some other examples of military power in international politics, aside from one portion of the navy? Is that all the U.S. has? We got a navy and a drone. Drones. Like invading countries. Right. Military invasion. operations. Special operations. Covert operations. Use. Yeah. Let's talk about the big one there. All of those sorts of things are critical determinants of military power. And all of these things, you know, are determined on a hierarchy and right now are the U.S. relative to every other country. You can check us off for every box. But other countries are dramatically working to improve these sorts of things and decrease the power differential. Globalization. Another big new thing in international politics. Anyone take a crack at what that looks like, what that means? Is it like um, basically trying to get all nations to work together type thing? Uh, sure, yeah, yeah, definitely. Increase the capability of uh, communication and stuff between nations would otherwise be. Yeah, definitely. Free. Communication networks. Economic interdependence. Mm -hmm. And can you explain that for everybody? The world economy is tied together in ways that it hasn't been before. Like trends like the International Monetary Fund and the creation of the World Bank, the fact that we can manipulate currencies across the world. Oh, and the fact that we have a euro as a consolidated cur currency for the EU means that economies are more interconnected and less isolated than before. All right, let's think about the example I just gave earlier. How much of U.S. Uh, bonds that the Chinese have? They could have wrecked the economy. They could have bankrupted us. Why haven't they? Why would it hurt them? Because we're a world economy. Because they're okay, a economy. But, but, what do, but what do we do for them? What's, what's in it? We buy their goods. Because we have a couple of critical exports. Like, they had to just buy our pork, econ pork sector because of the critical sector of their food security. Also, because the, our banking institutions are so interconnected that, like, even if only our banks go down, that means that their toxic assets will spread to other banks and lead to an international financial crisis. Kind of like what precipitated the great Right. Financial. Because the trade relationship between us, there's so many of their products that they have a comparative advantage in that we rely on, and so many of our products that we have an advantage in making that they rely on. So it is, they have no incentive, us or them, to sort of damage that relationship. Can anyone tell me what comparative advantage in trade means? LDRs. Uh, comparative advantage is when, well, the theory behind it, because that's what I know, is that um, one country focuses on what they're best at, and that's all they do, and that's what they then share with the world economy. Um, if one country can do, like, can do something better than another, then they should produce that in And it's not that, you know, no one else can, no one else, you know, sort of should. It just becomes an incentive that in which one country for the least price and can most efficiently produce a single product, other people are going to want to purchase that versus another country that attempts to create the same product. And the same thing, every other country is going to have some particular company, some particular natural resource that gives them the option to have a comparative advantage in which the other countries are going to have the exact same thing.
free trade versus protectionism. Protectionism is classic from the Great Depression. It's when all countries turn inward and don't trade with anybody else. They keep all their products at home, they deal with themselves, etc. That is the antithesis of globalization. Whenever the economy gets tight, as it did in the recession of 08, people start questioning whether they should continue trading with everybody else, whether that's a good idea, because we are so interconnected. If one thing happens, it has a cascading effect that ends up hurting everyone else. But the only thing that if we keep an openness where everyone views it as valuable to trade with everybody is the only mechanism that can continue to support globalization. International development policies. Monica already mentioned this, like the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank Organization. These are all big funding mechanisms in which the U.S. is a major party towards that can give money to poor countries for more development practices, to reduce poverty, to improve uh, certain political groups of uh, minorities, to increase human rights, and, ex and a multiplicity of different things that they can continue to support in governments in which that is needed. Liberal values. We went over this. Things that the U.S. thinks is valuable and views itself as integral to the overall system. Things of like democracy, human rights, capitalism, a free trade, a free market, a view of credible uh, military alliances. And the ultimate impact of that is they think uh, that there is no conflict because of democratic peace. Can anyone tell me what democratic peace theory is? So then the premise is all countries should be one. Right. The argument is that two democracies are never going to go to war with each other. So we have a lot less risk of conflict in a world of democracy. But not all countries are democracy, so we should continue to spread that system of government, that regime, those values that would put that in place to all other countries, or violence is going to continue. Transnational threats. Can you tell me what that is? Threat that doesn't know national borders, like uh, non state entities such as the Taliban. No, not the Taliban, no. Al Qaeda. Mm -hmm. what, are, what are some other things that are transnational threats? They affect the whole global warming. Global warming. Diseases. Diseases. Organized crime. Drugs trafficking, human trafficking. This is a very new trend in international relations. Something that affects everyone, thus it means the only way to solve it is that we all cooperate with each other because no country is going to be able to solve the problem by itself. <laughs> International development practices. Right? Are critically encouraged for all the aforementioned things. Continuing countries to be democracy. Getting them free trade policies making us appear more uh, legitimate and not that we just attempt to use military force at any point that we want because you know otherwise the sort of system we want can continue and it also has the opposite problem that we continue to generally overestimate how important we really are right there are a lot of other countries in the world and there are a lot of times when they can probably solve their own problem or it can be handled internally. And we sort of have a bias that always asserts that anytime there's an issue, we need to have a voice, we need to be involved. And that's not always true. And it, you know, as, as we've discussed before, led to some bad things where we've meddled in situations that are not in our own sphere of influence. 
non-state actors. Monarch already talked about this, non-governmental organizations. Charities, the Red Cross, political groups. Women's organizations in particular countries, obviously particularly in the Arab world. Tourists. International organizations, the IMF, the World Bank, the United Nations, are all things of a conglomeration of governments to organize for the purposes of cooperation for transnational threats and uh, legitimacy. And also, multinational corporations, Coca-Cola, McDonald's, these are countries or companies, rather, that go into many different countries and can, you know, sometimes help and hurt local economies of many different countries. Now, conflict in the international realm. The two sort of broad bases of conflict are interstate conflict. Can someone give me an example of interstate war? Uh, two states fighting each other. Yeah. India Pakistan go to conflict. That is just a conflict between two states. What about intrastate conflict? Civil war. Yeah, a conflict that happens within a country. Generally, civil war. And this is another big trend in international relations. It used to be two countries in a standoff. It's not so much anymore. Things like globalization mean we don't really have an incentive to fight with each other because they probably damage the economies. Things like nuclear weapons. People are probably not going to go to war with the U.S. or any other country that has a nuke. Things just like a natural norm against war. A lot of people don't like that. So these are things that make these type of conflicts the most uh, dangerous and likely things that are coming in the future via things like failed states, organized crime, and transnational uh, threats that develop here. Terrorism develops here. Now, all of the underpinning theories of international relations are broken down into three main ones. Realism, liberalism, and constructivism. These are going to underpin every single action in international politics. Every political statement made, every war, Every agreement, every treaty, everything is going to match up with one of these. A country generally believes in a certain particular aspect or a combination, so you will be able to generally predetermine how countries would likely respond to certain things. Realism. It starts from basic fundamental premise that human nature is evil. We're all greedy. We're all self-interested. When it comes to an action of a state, the U.S. is going to act in its best interest and not, you know, sort of in the interest of the world. We see this in uh, global warming. It's probably in the best interest that we sort of resolve a threat that could possibly have uh, catastrophic impacts. But rather than that, eh, you know, it might upset some conservatives in the domestic public. It might cost us some money. We don't really need to do that. So that is sort of the premise that self-interest and the state, not non-state actors, states at the international level are the only important actors in this theory. And you can tell, you know, this theory is quite old when, you know, terrorism is a very new development that kind of complicates some of these sorts of things. Liberalism. Liberalism in international relations is different from just liberalism and you know domestic politics. It's like what we've discussed: the 
the values that the U.S. likes. Instead of the international, the balance of power that realism pays attention to, this pays attention to regime type. Are you a democracy? Are you a dictatorship? Are you a failed state? Those are the things it thinks important. It doesn't care as much about what your power level is. It cares about what type of government you are. And as we've seen, liberalism is the determination of democracy is the best form of government. Human rights are intrinsically good. Capitalism and free markets are the type of system we should have. So see, we can already see there are some parts of both of these that the U.S. practices. This fundamental theory of human nature is that humans are good. We're probably nice. We like to cooperate when problems come about. We form international organizations like the IMF, like the World Bank, like the UN. All of these are sort of uh, developments. Globalization is a new trend that kind of reinforces liberalism. Liberalism, because it focuses on uh, cooperation and regime type, not just does not pay attention to states, but also non-state actors are relevant in liberalism. International organizations are relevant because not just the U.S. deciding, but the U.N.'s interpretation and the U.N.'s opinion of things are very important in liberalism because these are all institutions that continue to support it, and without them, we probably wouldn't have such a strong, you know, indoctrination of the belief in democracy, capitalism, human rights, all that good stuff. Now, constructivism. Constructivism is based in critical theory, and it operates as an indict of both of these theories. These two have agreements in some part. Constructivism says both of them are just completely and utterly wrong. We shouldn't care about balance of power. We shouldn't have we shouldn't want to force democracy or particular beliefs on other countries. These should all be, you know, their own sorts of choices. And that what we say about international politics, what we say is important, is the belief of one overhyped country, and they are socially constructed. Can anyone tell me what socially constructed means? That the international realm is socially constructed? Nobody? El Beard? That the world's uh, held together by social contract. We made the whole damn thing up. Two military officials sitting in a room determining what they would like it to be. You know, there's, there's no set way things are or have to be. Countries don't always respond the same way to every single thing. This whole balance of power, this whole, this is the best form of government, is all a social construction by a certain group of governments to think it, you know. Obviously, if everyone was a democracy, it would be in the U.S.'s interest, right? It would be good for us. Maybe not so much for some other countries. This is more focused on individual, interpersonal social relationships. Capitalism is bad. Capitalism causes exclusion. Capitalism causes poverty in between certain underdeveloped countries. Liberalism. Yeah, maybe it solves some more between democracies, but what about non-democracies? What if they say no? Then we invade them and tell them yes. You know, go America, but that's a, you know, it's a violent practice. You know, we would like to think the best things of people, but not the best things of power. Can anybody think of an example historically or recently that of the U.S. or any government that could represent any theory? Yeah. Uh, we talked about the United States with the liberalism, that word, uh, trying to spread democracy to other nations. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a lot of practice of the U.S. 
of liberalism. What about some other countries that think liberalism is valuable? Like right now or ever? Ever. Someone who has not raised their hand. You're telling me the U.S. is the only democracy in the world? America. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. The Soviet Union tried to spread communism during the Cold War. Right. Not exactly liberalism right, but the spread of a particular value system is kind of undergridded in that situation. But I'm not letting you get away with it. There is other democracies in the world. Let's start shooting some off. Jerusalem? Israel? Not bad. Great Britain. Great Britain. What about other people who speak English? Yeah, Great Britain. A democracy. We speak American, and they speak English. Australia. Australia. Right? You'll start noticing a pattern. All these democracies are also allies and people who speak a similar language. What about realism? What are some examples of where countries have acted in their own self-interest and only pay attention to power dynamics? North Korea. And what about them? Uh, they're realistic as in um, they really only trade with people who they need to get resources from and threaten everybody else. Right. And what did North Korea acquire that everyone is so scared of? Possibly nuclear missiles. Yeah. I don't trust it. What, what are we saying Iran's <laughs> trying to do that everyone's so scared of? <laughs> yeah, also acquire nuclear weapons, right? Because a country that acquires a nuclear weapon, the U.S. is probably going to make a lot of threats against, but we're not going to act on a single <laughs> one of those. <coughs> so it is in their self-interest they perceive, not in ours, but in theirs, to get nukes. Is it true that North Korea isn't actually that powerful and they just have a whole bunch of bravado and they seem tough? Like they're the third largest the third in the world. Yeah. Let me tell you a story. Was <laughs> a fair question, America. Uh, the the DM the DMZ. It's this big gap that was decided in the Korean War between North and South Korea. It is loaded with U.S. landmines everywhere. You know, so people can't cross it. There's a, a clear border. The North Koreans were trying to secretly and covertly. Oh God. Um, build a tunnel underneath it so they could get over to South Korea. Well, big bad U.S. government. We got onto that. Um, so as soon as we did, their solution was to tell us it was a coal mine. So they all got black paint and started painting the outsides of this tunnel to try to convince us that it was a coal mine while there was like hate America in there, all kinds of stuff. So maybe that tells you a little something about the North Korean military. Um, yep. It's also nine million people large. Which is the largest military. Oh, it is large. By a lot. And as of recent, have been begging us for money so they can feed their people. <laughs> Dude, have you seen Kim Jong-un? He doesn't need to be fed. Talk about failure to launch. What about some other examples of realism? U.S. Uh, during the Cold War. Go on. I mean, the uh, competition between the U.S. and Russia, like, came close to the brink multiple times. Exactly. Focused on the power dynamic. What about some examples of constructivism? Or these sorts of values maybe haven't been the best for some groups of people. Or the, yeah, grand old flag hasn't been so nice. The fact that coin actually breeds terrorism and is that the United States? Right. Our sort of counterterrorism operation, as we talked about Bin Laden earlier, the thing he cited 
as the number one primary reason for 9-11 was that we had military bases in their holy land. Right? Maybe we should respect some other cultures and not place a giant military base in a place that other people, you know, worship when they are telling you that they would like you to leave. It kind of breeds people to resist. And since the U.S. has such a large power differential, they have to respond asymmetrically. What about capitalism? Anyone think of some places in the world, some people, some things, maybe that hasn't been so good for? We tried to bankroll the entire South America and just go country by country, picking them off one by one, sending military in. It didn't work so well, you know. And now there are socialist governments there that we can't cope with. Yeah. Um, the great after the Great Depression, like some states started to like go back into like socialism, not not capitalism. Exactly. They found the capitalist system, as some did in the 08 recession, is illegitimate. It couldn't provide for us anymore. It's prone to crisis. And these are all reasons that we shouldn't have anymore. Countries where U.S. companies have moved to to set up the factories and stuff to, to like, bribe due to corruption in the government. Exactly. It's a big, bad North Korean military, everybody. <laughs> Now, some events that are of uh, popular discussion in international politics. Terrorism. Tell me some things. What about terrorism? Why is this a relevant issue? What's going on with terrorism in the U.S.? Or maybe some other countries? Somebody referenced Al Qaeda a few times. Someone's referenced the Taliban. <coughs> yeah. Um, people are scared that the new Al Qaeda leader might have gone hands on the nuclear weapons from Pakistan. Right. There's always a big fear. You know, conventional terrorist attacks, a few bombings here and there, is obviously not a good thing. Yeah. But the grand fear is if they get acquisition of a of a nuclear weapon and are possibly able to smuggle that into the U.S. to detonate it in a big city, you know. There are a lot of steps there that may make that extremely unlikely, but the possibility that it happens means we should be rather afraid, because if it does, we're kind of screwed. And what are some organizations we have and some policies we've implemented to deal with this threat? been recent leaks of some things we've done to try to deal with this that two of you have mentioned. The dude who fled the country as of recent. Snowden. Yeah. But what what is what is he trying to reveal? What is this broader trend of policy that we've implemented to respond to 9-11? Like spying on terror. Right. You know, domestic and international surveillance. Right? We've got the FBI for those sorts of things that were to ever happen. And we've got the clandestine service of the CIA internationally with covert operations. We've got special operations units in the military. And the way, you know, we keep intel is, you know, domestic surveillance. Intelligence gathering internationally in cooperation with other intelligence services uh, like the MI6 with uh, the British. Is nuclear terrorism the only possibility or negative implication of terrorism that could be discussed here? Cyber terrorism? Right, that's the new big hot thing because a government, cyber terrorism doesn't necessarily have to be a non state actor, can be North Korea, a military we make fun of. 
that we would lay waste to in a war. They've got one sophisticated virus can start firing our nukes for us and ourselves. Can break down all transportation infrastructure. Bring the entire country to a halt. You can have the weakest military in the world. They can have the weakest cultural power in the world. But if they have one sophisticated tech, they can bring it all down. Do they? Well, if I were working for the CIA, I wouldn't tell you. Organized crime. What are some examples of organized crime? The Mafia. Cartels. Drug cartels. Human trafficking. Human trafficking. For example, the Russian mob. Everyone's probably, you know, heard a little bit. Um, but what you probably don't know is how involved they are in the U.S. The Russian mob is said to control the entirety of the Russian government, pretty much. All the military, everything. But the Russian mob and mafia organizations of the sort have large money laundering organizations in the U.S. that can be a support mechanism for terrorists if they would like to come into the U.S. or if they need funding for particular things for drug trafficking, for human trafficking. These are all things that are massive funding for either political clout within the U.S. government or, or just a directly negative acts of terrorism. And what is a similarity of the nature of the threat between these two? They are both a type of threat that we have discussed earlier. Transnational. These are both, obviously, the Russian mob is in Russia, the U.S., many countries within Eastern Europe. Drug trafficking, smuggling of human sex trafficking, all those things are very international. And even if we successfully thwart them in the U.S., the operation can come back. There are many other countries. These are things that demand either international organizations or global cooperation of some sort. Ethnic conflict and failed states are both two other sort of transnational uh, threats. Because of new developments of globalization, nuclear weapons, and etc. that make the likelihood of interstate conflict less likely, there's always a prediction. Mexico's economy is in the tank. They're going to become the next failed state. These Arab governments are in transition. They're all going to become failed states. <coughs> all these oil-producing countries, if prices go high enough, we're all going to become failed states. If they cannot properly function, and then they become safe haven for terrorists, organized crime, any sort of illicit activities become a lot easier in countries that don't have a control over the law anymore. What about the global economy? Now we popularly hear in debates that because we are so interconnected, a tank and the global economy would have sort of negative implications. A decline in the economy is, Professor Stein said, probably not going to immediately cause countries just to start firing nukes willy-nilly. Uh, but it can hamper liberal values, the trend towards democracy, the trend towards free trade, the trend towards capitalism, all things that we find to dampen the likelihood of conflict. All of these things become a lot more likely in a world with decrease of the global economy. What about resource conflict? Can anybody think of some conflicts that we could have over resources? Oil. Yeah, what are, some, what are some examples of conflicts that maybe have been caused or Oil is a part of it. That's getting way too involved in the airspace. 
Right, Arab Spring, you know, Iraq before that, with very particular <laughs> and focused resources that are very important to the U.S. way of life, so we need to have the military to constantly maintain them. And what's, what's something to say about, you know, oil? What type of resource or what type of energy is it? Is it renewable? So that means it's not going to last forever. And there are certain countries, you know, the U.S. is very dependent on consuming it. We also produce a lot as a reason. But there are some countries that that is the basis of their entire economy, is that other countries would buy oil. And you can only imagine what things might be happening in a world where oil becomes very finite. There are only, you know, so many days and months and years left what calculations countries start having. About the U.S. and China, we sort of discussed this, the likelihood of conflict. This may be minimized by having a strong global economy, but what is something that the Chinese want to have that currently characterizes the international order that the U.S. does have? Someone who has not spoken yet. Jared, the U.S. leads the world. What is something the Chinese also want? Yeah, the Chinese also want to lead the world, and for the U.S. not to. So while we may be interconnected, and the economy may be determined that you know, we should have some sort of beneficial relationship, but at some point, it's got to give way when you have two powers that are rising in the exact same regions and both want control of the exact same regions. That has historically never happened without major tension. Human rights. What are some sort of beliefs I guess we have about human rights internationally? You know, the media and the U.S. have a lot of these depictions of the Arab world. Do we think they're as liberal as us and have significant human rights practices? No, what's a particular group we think they mistreat often? Women. Yeah, what, why do we, why do we say that? Now, what everyone needs to understand, you know, as well, is that it's a very Western conception and a very particular cultural standpoint that suggests those sorts of claims in the first place that, you know, women ought to be treated in a certain way, and for them as well. And we find countries with those types of practices as illegitimate and that need to be addressed and that's generally resolved by this form of government. Now, Sure, it's IR, but there are a lot of domestic implications of international relations. Whether you'd like to think that there's a big difference between the two political parties, and there may be in some areas, but not in foreign policy. The last 200 years is a good historical record that both the Democrats and both the Republicans are war hawks. They all are at some point going to decide that a certain emergency necessitates that the U.S. needs to intervene. For the Democrats, it's generally human rights abuses, sort of genocides that we need to be involved in. For the Republicans, maybe some more self-interested notions of oil or instability. But all the same, there's been a general trend of us being involved in international politics and that we should be always involved and that every crisis should demand a U.S. You know, response. As long maybe we're not directly involved in that conflict, maybe we're not sending aid, but we've said 
how the solution needs to go down? Are we okay a country's decision to do what they would like to do? But when the U.S. first started out, it wasn't always the same thing. The Founding Fathers. Thomas Jefferson said, Commerce with all nations, alliance with none. The Founding Fathers were big supporters of liberal values, big supporters of, you know, free markets and free economics, that we should trade and cooperate and work with a lot of countries, but that we should have no entangling alliances. If Israel gets in a skirmish because it bombs some people, that should be their own damn fault that they have to deal with it. And it's not the U.S.'s immediate goal when an ally gets themselves into a skirmish that we always have to be directly involved. So it still is a supporter of those sorts of things, same things, just rather than enforcing democracy, rather than enforcing capitalism, we should just be a model for those sorts of things. Immigration should be free. People should be allowed to come here and view this as a valuable place, but that not that any of these values should be imposed upon people. Domestic freedom. We've talked about this. The U.S., you know, having the idea that, you know, not North America, not this continent is in our region, but the entire world is in our purview. The entire world is our region, right? Anything that happens on the, you know, the other side of the pond, the other side of the world in Asia, all of those sorts of things are our business, also has a deteriorating effect on domestic liberties, right? The things that we personally have a choice in the security policy, things like continual war, things like, you know, continual intervention, necessitate things like large surveillance programs. It was Benjamin Franklin that, you know, I'll paraphrase, that said something around the effect that, you know, if you prefer, you know, security over freedom, you deserve neither, right? That if we constantly try to impose virus, or we constantly try to create security for the world, it has a deteriorating effect on domestic policy. Not only does it undermine funding for social programs that we would like to have here, but also domestic liberties get negatively impacted that uh, we would like to have. That is it. IR 101. Cool. Everyone take a five minute, five minute break. I can just get to